Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dogs and Hogs. My name is Roddy DeBulsey. I'm joined by Russ Tanner, the number one guy on the show, the main reason you were here. Not right. as cool as having Coach Donnan on on Tuesdays. You know, everybody tunes in for that, but uh, it is good to have 100%, 100% accurate. Jimmy D is the man. <laughs> no, but it, it's always great to have Russ Tanner on. I would love to talk to him on Wednesdays. Uh, Coach brings so much information and so much analysis. is great. And then talking to you, is, it's just as much, you know, because we get the coaches – perspective then we get the players perspective and i figure by the end of the week if you've had recruiting on monday coaching on tuesday players on wednesday you know what 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 the, what the topics are you've seen it from every different aspect from the yeah. high school kids to the coaches to the players we've got everything covered now we just need some equipment guys and some stadium people and hey we, we, i'm sure we can get me shad or some of the old guys to come on and join us on here but yeah i've known me shad 30 years yeah. You probably never had a conversation that was longer than two sentences. <laughs> yep. For those of those, John Michette, uh great guy, number one equipment man in America. Uh, and then, you know, like, uh, I think of like Tyler and not Tyler, uh, the, the, the facilities guys. Yeah. Um, it, man, it's such a different world now, by the way, with, with what all happens over there. Michette's a great guy, he's a buddy. I know him, and, and I go in there, uh, you know, some of the old players, we go in there, we try to rob Meshad blind without him uh, seeing it. Because, you know, back in our day, we didn't have Meshad. We had Dave Allen, God rest his soul. Um, I remember Dave, yes. You, could, you couldn't you could sneak a, a used jock strap out without Dave Allen knowing about it. So uh, I feel like I'm owed a little bit by the program, and Meshad, uh, I don't think he's got quite the keen eye that Dave Allen did, but yeah. I remember well, I was the last one to leave a locker room one time, and they there were all those Georgia G gloves yeah. on the ground. There are tons of them. I'm like, these are player worn gloves, and they're just everywhere. Yeah. And I'm like, I got a 13 year old son. Ali's going to love them. <laughs> so I reached out, I pick them up, and I'm like, can I take these? They're like, sure. I yeah. bring it to him. Of course, it's like, uh, you know, right. <laughs> in his hand. I probably picked, you know, like uh, Max Jean Gillis gloves, right. you know, I mean, just big paws. Monster of a man. Yeah, you know, somebody like that. It wasn't a, a cornerback or somebody like that, you know, so, mm -hmm. but he loved him. He was all excited to get him. But I'm like, man, there's so much gear around here. It's just yep. not safe. It, it's, it, yep. and to your point, it is a different world. Of course, now with NIL, they need to sell all that stuff. You know, I, I'm surprised you don't see more of that, by the way. I, there must be some stuff between, like, the game use stuff they can't do and all that because, you know, it's like when we had Coach Rick on the show a couple of months ago talking about the Todd Gurley situation, how he wanted to just to lie and deny about yeah. he sold some, sold some gear. Uh, I'm assuming they can't sell, like, game-worn jerseys and game-worn gloves from UGA, but, um, you know. Well, here's the thing, they can because they've, they've auctioned that stuff off, but I'm like, look. When the the players are heading towards the stadium and they start taking off all their gloves and the headbands and stuff and they start tossing by the crowd, that's great. There's a there's a yeah. seven year old, eight year old who's that's going to make his whole freaking year. But take that jersey, send it all to the Classic City Collective. Imagine what you could get for a used Brock Bowers jersey or a Lad McConkey jersey or a Smile Munden jersey. You know, I'm like, you guys are having nil issues. All right, here's, so, here's, so here's the first. Here's the first topic for our audience for those those who are watching who is your favorite either you or your kid the favorite player that you've ever got something tossed or given to you after a game from i know, I know my answer by the way okay um, i gotta think about mine but go ahead give me yours all right mine mine is twofold all right so i've got two of them one baseball one football and neither are uga related but growing up in wrightsville washington county was just up the road from us and when i was in probably middle school takio spikes gave me a pair of gloves and uh Takiyo Spikes was the greatest high school football player I'd ever seen at that point you know obviously went to Auburn uh played for the 49ers forever you know should be an NFL Hall of Famer he was that good so I got Takiyo Spikes my favorite one though man I was probably like 13 years old we go to a Braves game Fulton County Stadium and all this new fancy stuff now they got the old school Braves Stadium down there and um it got to be uh extra innings and I ended up, we were up, up higher, extra innings, a bunch of people left. It was bad weather. Maybe it was bad weather. People left because of rain. Like, we didn't leave, whatever. I ended up going down to the back of the dugout, and I'm sitting, like, on the dugout, on the first base side of the Braves dugout. And my favorite player was Ryan Klesko. Oh, man, the van. So, yeah. So I was trying to get Ryan Klesko to toss me something the entire game. 
Well, he ended up, I think, getting subbed out. They pinch hit for him, or pinch ran, whatever it was. So he was on the bench. So I was down there. At that point, I started getting on Fred McGriff yelling, crime dog. Crime ball, dog. Throw the ball, crime dog. And he wouldn't ever do it. And like the 18th inning, it had to be. He goes in the dugout and just reaches over the top and just whoop, throws a hook shot. And it was a floater. And it was coming in. And there's a lady beside me whose hand was right here. And the ball's coming down to that lady's hand. It gets right here. And I went. <laughs> and I caught a ball from the crime dog. And that is the maddest I've ever seen a grown woman in my life at a 12-year-old boy. She thought I was like 14 or probably 16 or 17. I was about to say, come on, you weren't a small 12-year-old. No, I snatched the crime dog's ball out of her hand in Atlanta, Fulton County Stadium, and still got it to this day. So, yeah, hey, by the time it. she's done with that story, you are a 47-year-old man with a <laughs> gun who was just out of prison with a scar that took out one of your eyes, you know. Yep. So that's it for me. Takiyo Spikes and Fred McGriff. Both, I, I both got tossed something from both those guys growing up. So, yeah, those were awesome. See, people always say, you know, what's what's the craziest autograph you got? I've never done autographs. I've never done really gear uh, because I was a photographer for, for years. So I'm like, I have pictures of all these guys. I was there with them. I don't need to prove that I met, you know, Char Charles Barkley because I took pictures of him. You know, I covered uh, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, you know. I've covered Braves games, you know, I shot all those guys. I've got, I can go through my files, my negatives, my slides, my uh, digital files. There's tons of that stuff. So there's never that thing, but I'll say uh, running into no Sean years and years ago, he came back to the stadium one time. And I'm like, man, you ran up out of bounds one time and ran me over. He's like, oh, sorry. You know, he's, he's completely, I didn't mean to I'm like, yeah, bent my monopod all to hell, you know? And he's like, how much was that? Oh. Well, oh, no, I said, well, I said, you bent the monopod and you, I lost my lens hood. You broke the lenses off. He just pulls out a big wad of money about to pay me like 40, 60 bucks for a lens hood from 10 years ago. I'm like, no, that's okay. Yeah, man. That's a, just the gesture. I right, may have so taken look, money, we, but we I'm got, not going to talk gotta, about that right now. Look, <laughs> we got a lot of UJ stuff to talk about, but last question before we get into all this, all, cause we got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. All right, so that's fine. You don't, you're not into autographs. you just big time. It's all the people you've been around. So hold your cup up. Which cup? But you I can never show that I was with them I because it's always hold on. Me. I got a question. Hold your cup up. Hold your cup up. Who's it from? Where's the uh, cup Steve, from? Steve Arenos. Steve Arenos, Athens. All right. So if you went in the nineteen eighty nine, not nineteen ninety nine. If you went to Steve Arenos in like nineteen ninety eight, back in the day, who of the athletes that you've seen covered or would like to see would you fangirl over the hardest that they're sitting inside of Steve Arenos? And you got a chance to go see him, say what's up, take a picture with him, whatever. At the time, going back then, it would have probably been Stafford. Yeah. I mean, he just, was the biggest just, recruit, biggest recruit we'd ever had at that point. Just bigger than life. Yeah. You know, that, that was the guy who's just a monster. Now he he was a pro even in even in college. Yeah. You know, it, it felt like you had an NFL guy on the roster. While he was here, yeah, you know? and there's a million of them, especially when you start talking to these kids. I mean, we interviewed a kid the other day, he's a class of 2027. You know, it's like you're a high school freshman, well, like a ninth grade, yes, a ninth grader, yeah, he's a ninth grader, but he's one of the top players in the nation. So, we interviewed, I remember talking to uh, uh, oh man, why can't I think of him? Uh, he went to Grayson and then went to Ole Miss, Kim Dichie. Kim Dichie, Robert Kim Dichie, as a as a seventh and eighth grader, we interviewed him twice. Yeah, because <laughs> we went to a gym to see another guy, and he was over there working out. We're like, we're asking the trainer, "Who's that guy?" He goes, "Oh, that's Robert Kim Dichie. He's got an older brother, be a Grayson." And we wound up interviewing uh, Robert in like seven the, after the summer, the summer after seventh grade. Yeah. So you get to know these guys a long time, and so it's yeah. tough to see them as, you know, a big star. I mean. Stetson Bennett was still the curly haired glass wearing punk, you know, from rising seniors. It doesn't matter. They don't seem huge, but Matt Stafford, when he came in, he seemed like the man. You know, yeah. That's, this was the guy. It's like, and then I guess what also did it was the whistle that that ball made in the air when he threw it and you, and the arrival velocity when it landed, <laughs> Yeah. when it came to the receiver's hands, it wasn't just the thump. It was the ball coming in. You never hear balls coming in. Yeah. You know, at the end, they're, they're, they've they've given up all their velocity, all their trajectory is just it, it's spent. 
Yep. His balls come in like they're shot of a damn cannon. Right. Like a judge machine. He's a human judge machine. And I'm so glad that he's had the career that he did. Yep. Hall of Famer. Yeah. First one. Uh, we got Foster Moss on there. There you go. What's Foster? This was my hometown, Warrington, Georgia, not too long ago. Kenny Boris Barbecue. Kenny North. It was North. There's a typo there. Uh-huh. Kenny Boris Barbecue. Yeah. By the way, that's probably my favorite review I've ever done. So if you're looking for one on my Instagram or Facebook, go back and watch it. It's amazing. There's a dog named Jackass that makes an appearance in the review. There's trucks cranking up. It was great. Down in Warren County, Warrington, Georgia. I love it. Well, see, Forrest had a typo, but he's not uh, buzzed on watermelon wine like I am. Shout out to Rachel Nabulsi, my wife, having her birthday today. We had a little uh, nice little dinner there. So it's going to be a fun show. Happy and, birthday, uh, Nabulsi. Thank you. And uh, Willie Gray says, no Sean dancing on the ladder versus Auburn, the soldier boy, right in front of me, something I'll never forget. <laughs> Man, oh, dude, those black jerseys. How much money could Georgia have made off all those black jerseys? An, an unbelievable amount. I, I, I will say to this day, I mean, it's not the greatest win Georgia's ever had, and I'm not going to say it was even the greatest game I've ever been to. Shit, no, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was a contested game until the third quarter. Yeah, the atmosphere in that stadium when Georgia came out in those black jerseys and then the fourth quarter of that game – was probably one of the most fun times I've ever had in Sanford Stadium, including times I played. So, you know, it was just, that was cool, man. That was really cool. So, well, leading, hope, hopefully this year they will have a black jersey game. I, I don't know that Kirby Smart will do it. And I'm I not saying that he will. I don't think you will. I, I think that, and this is not an original to me, my buddy, my buddy Seth Welch is the one I hear leading the charge of people I know. But it, it seems to me like if you're going to do it, like, yeah, we're past the point of doing a um, kind of a – what is it when you throw something in there just for the heck of it? Um, oh, shoot. I can't think of the word. If you just throw something in there, it doesn't really mean anything. You're trying to surprise them. The novelty. We don't do it for novelty, novelty yeah, I got you. anymore. Um, I think it should be a set thing. Like once a year, first night game of the season at home or something like that or games that kick off after 7 p.m. at home whatever it may be. Just go ahead and set it before the season. Say, this is what we're going to yeah. do going forward. And then it's no big deal when you come up and everybody's like, oh. oh. You okay there? I lost audio on Russ there. Russ, you may need to reconnect there real quick. <laughs> Still can't hear you. I'll have him reconnect and then come back with us. Uh, gratuitous, yeah. <laughs> Jeff Tyre says, <laughs> yeah, it is gratuitous. And I'm with you there. I like the idea of um, go ahead, set it up ahead of time, do it. And I don't expect, I don't want to say Kirby Smart's superstitious, but it's almost as if if he does it, if he announces that week, He's so annoyed with the way the media would handle it, the way the fans would focus on that and not the actual game itself. And he doesn't want the players thinking about it. He doesn't want the players doing it. And he knows that if you ever, if you ever set it up and you set that uh, blackout game and they lose because of it, or not because of it, but they happen to lose, people will lose their damn mind. So, I can see why he doesn't do it. And I, I asked about it. I think it was that Kirby, uh, that uh, Jake from year, because he had done it the year before. Right. And I said, uh, hey, what game is he going to do it? And it was somebody in the trainer's office. I'm, I mean, the equipment office. I'm not going to say it was Meshad, because, again, me, Meshad and I have only had, like, a conversation that's three words long. Hi. Hey, good to see you again. Uh, <laughs> the, the person who was an assistant there says, we're not changing anything. Man. Yeah. We're on a winning streak. Yeah, we, we he will not do it. We are not. We're not changing nothing around. And that's why when remember Eason got healthy again, step yeah. back in your starting role, Jacob Eason. No, Kirby's like we're not changing the damn. Nah, thing. And he almost won a national title without changing anything. So I'm not saying he's superstitious, but he's a little stitious. He's a little stitious. There ain't no doubt about that. So yeah, I don't know. I would love to see the Black Jersey this year, and I would buy the crap out of one from an NIL standpoint. But what do I know? <laughs> I like Jeff that stubborn is a word for Kirby. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, if you're stubborn because you're you're winning titles, that works. Who's gonna care? Yeah, nobody. Uh, speaking of uh this will be the eighth anniversary of the 93 K Day. 
this coming Saturday. Yep. Remember Kirby Smart first gets hired. He's at the uh, Arkansas basketball game. He comes out, says, look, there's great energy in it because that game between Arkansas is going back and forth. Georgia wins the game in overtime. But when he's introduced as the new Bulldogs head coach, the whole place goes nuts. And he says, look, I love the energy. I want to see that same energy for G-Day in a couple weeks. We want 93,000 people in the stands. Yep. A ridiculous ask. The administration got behind it, started branding at 93K Day. They got more than 93,000 people in there. Yeah, it was wild. I I don't think that the uh, fire marshal was allowed into the stadium (laughs) or he kicked everybody out. But the point is that had a huge uh, effect on all the recruits. The recruits loved it. You got Andrew Thomas, Stetson Bennett, some of those guys who wound up winning you a couple titles. Yeah. Crazy times. Uh, changed your whole outlook. Now we're going to have a big G day this weekend. Uh, won't be 93,000, but it'll be a lot. You know, yep. still get that carryover. A lot of uh, big uh, recruits sitting in the stands. What are you, and to the point, Kirby being stubborn, he's not going to show us a lot. No. He's not going to show us, but you're going to see twenty, at least 22 new players. Yeah. So what do you want to see? Man, you know, so so G Day, honest if I'm being honest, and we're we're amongst friends here, so I'm gonna be honest. So this is not this is not great um content. Okay. G Day is boring to me. It it okay. it just it just is. Like my kids love to go, my wife loves to go. I don't love to go. It's always hotter than crap up there. And now that you can see it on uh TV, I usually I don't want to go, but we always look up the weather for Saturday just because I don't know. All right, you let you let me know when you find it. So, but but I think I think it's interesting whenever you have every year with G Day with spring, what you want to see is the new guys coming in, right? We we don't have questions about Carson Beck, nope. right? We don't have questions about Malachi Stark, Tate Ratledge, Ernest Green. I mean, these guys that are your that are your veteran guys there. You know, maybe there's a little bit of people's like, oh, what's Oscar Delp going to look like as he's the man? But even that, to me, is not what you really look for. To me, I think the thing you're hoping for and wanting to see is those guys who either are new to the program. What's K.J. Bolden look like back there beside Malachi Starks? You know, what's that guy look like? And for me, I think the running back situation is something I really want to I'm not sure that we know who the man is right now. We think ETN, but, you know, he may be out for a game to start the season. He's never been in this program before. Um, you know, you got Branson Robinson coming back, Andrew Paul getting back healthy. So you got a lot of pieces you want to see there. And then, you know, I always think it's interesting, like the name that's been buzzing the most as far as what I've seen online is Arian Smith, right? And Arian Smith, like the buzz around how fast Arian Smith is, is growing to be an epic legend. Like every time I see it, he's that much faster. But all the reports out of anybody that sees practice or puts anything out right now is that Arian Smith looks like a different dude. I yeah. think you get really excited when you have a guy that's world class speed, the fastest guy on the team. As I, I think he is legit, he's legitimately the fastest football player in America. Yeah. Now, the reason I say that, remember his freshman year, he's running the hundred meters, and he qualified for the NCAA finals with a ten point one. Ten point one six. Unbelievably fast. He ran, so, he ran the finals. I mean, that's yeah. nuts. So I, I think that's the you know that's the big thing as far as the offensive line is concerned. You always want to see the O line there, but really, it's just Cedric Van Pran is the only piece that you're missing. Everywhere else, you feel really good about Ernest Green. You look at Ernest Green on one side, Trust on the other, Ratledge at guard over there. Then you got Fairchild and Michael Morris rotating the other guard. Both of them played a ton of football with. Uh, oh, what's our center's name? Jared. Um, Jared Wilson. Jared Wilson. Sorry, um, being the only part you don't really see there. So I mean, you want to see him play a little bit, but I mean, even this year, the O line's not going to be. The focal of the focal point of spring. I think you're looking at really these young pups. Um, you're looking at, like I said, KJ Bolden. You're looking at all these other five star guys that came. Ellis in. Robinson. Yeah, L- Ellis Robinson. I mean, I, I think those two right there are the the two that just from a physical talent standpoint, everybody is waiting to see the jaw drop. You're hoping you're going to see something out of those two. It's like, all right, I get it now. Um, you know, and then you may be looking a little bit to see like who doesn't play a ton. We talk about. The transfers coming from the portal situation. You may know a lot <laughs> for those who really pay attention about what happens on Saturday about, hey, why is so-and-so not playing a whole lot? He's healthy, right? Eh, there's probably something going on there. So, um, you know, I, I think G-Day is very um, informative. I think it's good. I think it's great for the coaches. It's great for, especially with all the 
the early enrollees, which is now the way of life. Like we almost don't even have to qualify the kids are early enrollees anymore because everybody is. We qualify yeah, the kids. This is a lot easier to point out the kids who did not yeah. enroll early. We can you just said saying early enrollees. You go, hey, the freshmen are here, and then we got the late arrivals. Yeah, that's exactly right. The late arrivals are the ones we don't see. So, um, you know, we know we're not going to see a ton out of Carson Beck. You know, he's not going to get touched. He's not going to get hit. If anybody hits Carson Beck, they're going to be put into the transfer portal. <laughs> they, don't, they don't get to go on their own. They get put into the transfer portal. Um, the snipers are ready around the 600 level. Exactly. But then after Carson Beck, I do think there's a lot of interest in what Gunnar Stockton looks like because the, the quarterback situation at UGA right now is very, very thin as far as guys that you trust and feel good about being in there. It's Carson Beck, and then it's a long way to the next guy being Gunnar Stockton. Then after Gunnar Stockton, there's nobody that we feel good about right now. And that's not a knock on Ryan Puglisi or any, any of the guys like that. It's just a matter of no, spring. Yeah, nobody else has any experience. And, and Stockton doesn't have a ton of experience. So things like G-Day for Gunnar Stockton are very important because it's – you, you can't mimic the speed of a game in practice as much as you try, as hard as Georgia practices. But GA gives you a glimpse of that. So um, a lot of eyes are going to be on Gunnar Stockman this week. You know, there's a lot of conversation I was reading on the band today that the everybody pretty much says that Georgia's going to get a, a, a portal QB, right? I mean, they expect Georgia to go out and get somebody in the portal to be a quarterback going into the fall camp. So that you've got at least somebody else with game experience on your roster. Um so Gunnar Stockton's going to feel some pressure going into the game to perform to make sure that he is solidly the number two guy and maybe take a little bit of the desire from Kirby and the crew from going out and finding another quarterback in the portal to bring in. So, um, well, even you know, then, he, he wants to have four scholarship QBs. Yep. you got three now. And people go, well, well, you're fine with Carson Beck. Well, that's what I thought. We, we mentioned the 2017 season. Eight plays in. Yep. And you lost Jacob Eason for the year. Yep. Well, you know, I mean, he came back midway through, but I mean, you lost him. He was definitely out for a while there. Uh, the entirety of Stetson Bennett's career comes on because JT Daniels gets hurt. So, That's exactly right. uh, look at the uh, FSU. They don't play for national title because the quarterback back gets hurt. And the committee goes, That is a, such a devastating injury to your program. We're not even going to vote you in the top four. Yep. You went undefeated. Uh, quarterbacks get injured all the time. And it would be the most Georgia thing in the world that you've got the guy who just set the com past completion percentage record at the University of Georgia, who should have a Heisman campaign come in and somebody roll up on his ankle, just, mm -hmm. just in, in the it's stupid not or hell stepping off the bus. It would not. It would be a very Georgia thing. It would not shock me. But to your point, that's why I bet I asked twice in back to back weeks about Gunner Stock, just because. To, it, they are thin, and I think Gunner is an absolute baller. And I think if he has to step in, that's great. Yeah, but you can have injuries to two QBs again. Florida State, real, <laughs> real bad. So, I mean, George, 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 like him who throws himself all over the place. He he runs the ball with abandon. He yeah, he acts like he's immortal. Yeah, and and, and by the way, that I think you'll see some Gunner Stockton action this year. I don't know. If Carson oh, Beck's yeah. going to play, but you're going to see Gunnar Stockton getting some game reps this year that mean something. You're going to see him run the ball, throw the ball, trying to make some reads. So um, this is a big first step for him being the number two guy, which is a very important place to be. So, um, yeah. And, I mean, you know, I got Willie Grace and talking about Puglisi right there. So he's got that dog game like Stafford, Murray, and Stetson. I agree. I'm, I'm a fan of Ryan Puglisi. I've heard Coach Don talk about him, about how much he how, – how good he feels about him. But – he is a baby puppy. Like, he hadn't even quit getting milk from his mama yet, you know, as far as his football life is concerned. So, you know, if you got to, if you got to depend on a true freshman to be your quarterback in the SEC, you ain't winning. It just ain't going to happen the way football's played these days. So, um, yeah. Jake, Jake Fromm did it. Yeah. I, Jake Fromm is different. <laughs> you know, Jake Fromm is different. Um, you're 100% you're, you're correct. That's, but, yeah, you don't want to be in that – situation especially on the road at Ole Miss at Texas at Alabama Come on. yeah Hell this no. is a but hard schedule this year man like this it is, is a hard schedule so um, I guess, go, ahead. go ahead let's say for me what a, the quarterback you know I want to see the backup quarterback I want to see what Trevor Etienne can do Rod Robinson we know he's strong we know he's a giant back and he just mows people down 
but does he have that kind of speed to break through? We're not going to see a lot of running plays. We're not going to see Andrew Paul or Cash Jones get the ball a lot. It's just too violent for this offense and defense to crash together and tackle. So the ball is going to go in the air a lot. It's going to be a lot of vanilla plays. Uh, but to your point, you can see K.J. Bold to do some stuff. You can see Ellis Robinson, who from everything we're hearing is – there's a reason he was ranked the number one cornerback in the nation. So yeah. Ellis Robinson Jr. could be the man. Uh, I, I made this point with Coach John the other day because Kirby was asked about it. Uh, we, we had people at the scrimmage, the first one, and it was shown that the offensive line is cohesive and they were, I won't say having their way, but they were ahead of the defense. Yeah. And, of course, he was asked, are you worried about your defensive line? Because you don't have a Devontae White. You don't have a Jordan Davis. You don't have a uh, Jalen Carter. Carter. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't. Um, you you have a, a, a Stackhouse. You have a Brinson. You have a Jordan Hall. You have a Jamal Jarrett. They're good, but they're not yeah. those guys. Not yet. You got a Christian yeah. Miller. Uh, you know, and so Kirby's like, well, what's your question? I mean, are you – There's am I concerned about it? said, I wouldn't change my defensive front for anybody's in the nation, which I thought was a huge boost of confidence. Yeah. And I realized the number one reason we're more concerned about that was, well, two reasons. A, there's a video clips going around of an Alabama guy, a, two Alabama uh, offensive linemen engaging with one three technique and knocking him to the ground as if, you know, you're supposed to be able to survive a two-on-one, you know, completely unscathed and take them both on. Uh, and two, by comparison, if you look at that inside linebacker room, those guys are freaks. Yeah. Outside linebackers, you signed three of the best ones last year. You know, outside linebacker defensive ends. I know people are worried about Chaz Chambliss, but I'm like, when you got Gabe Harris and Damon Wilson, yep. come on, man. This is this is going to be good. Uh, you brought in some absolute killers in the recruiting class. You got it. Your secondary is nuts. You got four cornerbacks. There's a question from Jeff. Uh, hey, are you know is uh, who are you going to lose in the portal? I hope you can keep all your cornerbacks, but you got cornerbacks that can go play elsewhere yep. and, and start. So and, your safeties are good, hey. your cornerbacks are inside, outside, your offensive linemen, tight ends, quarterback, wide receivers, everything's good. You're hell, your kickers. Your kickers won the best in the nation. Your punters killing it this spring. So yeah. the weak link, if you will, is there's not a first round draft pick on the defensive line. So we're all worried about the defensive line. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think the two position groups, and I, I'll, I'll talk about the defensive line. I think two position groups with the most questions going in, and one of them, I don't know, I could be wrong with this, but one of them is going to be the wide receiver group, just because I think you're missing Ladd and you're missing Marcus Resume, Jack Saint, and some other guys that, that have been just absolute dudes for you. So I think the question is who's going to be the dude for it? You know, you feel good about Dom Lovett, feel good about Rara, um, you feel good about other guys in the program, Colby Young, some of the guys coming in, you've heard good things about it, but like who's going to be the guy for Carson Beck that ends up, he ends up creating – um, that chemistry with that you know he's going to feel good about. Lad McConkey and Brock Bowers are gone. I mean, those were his two security blankets. When something had to happen, Lad or Brock were always open. So who's going to be that guy for him to throw the ball to now when when things are tight? Look, it's not going to matter when we play ball state or something like that. We're going to have guys wide open all the time. He can find them, he can hit them. But when you go to Texas, when you play Alabama, when you get Auburn, Kentucky, Florida, Tennessee, whoever it may be on the murderer's row of that SEC schedule, you got to have a wide receiver that is your dude who you know if it's third and seven in the fourth quarter with three minutes to go and you don't convert right here, you're going to have to go put a fourth down and punt the ball away and lose. Who's the guy that you can always look to? Like, we don't know who that is right now because Ladd and Brock are gone. Um, as far as – as far as on the other side, you're exactly right on the defensive line. Like the defense line last year was maligned a little bit. From it, it went from one of the absolute strengths of every Kirby team before that to last year. But I was like, all right, where, where's everybody at? You know, where's all the dudes who are disrupting the game and changing it so that the offense has to adjust their game plan to stop what we're doing? And we got used to that, by the way, watching Trayvon Walker, watching Jalen Carter, watching Jordan Davis, Devontae Wyatt. We got really spoiled by a lot of first-round guys. So the talent is there. Who's going to be the breakthrough guy in that group up there? And you know what, man? Like, they are getting hammered in practice right now by this veteran offensive line. So, um, you know, if you see a defensive player make a play, a defensive line make a play in the spring game, feel good about that. <laughs> <'Cause they're going laughs> men jump up, cheer your ass off. Line. So, yeah, I mean, two position groups. We talked about Gunnar Stockton. 
I'm, I'm interested in running backs, all that stuff. The running back situation at Georgia is going to be fine because the offensive line is going to be really good and you got really talented guys running the football. So, for me, it's going to be wide receiver group. It's going to be the defensive line. Who steps up and becomes the bell cow for those two groups that we know we can count on when the, you know, when it's nut cutting time, who are your guys? So, yeah, to your point, I, I, it's really easy to say, well, the, the tight ends will be fine. Come on, man. You, you lost the greatest tight end in college football ever. Mm hmm. And that's not a shot against Oscar Delp. I love the kid. Yep. And it, it, I thought, you know, Pierce, this would be Pierce Ferland's year, but he's done with football. Yep. He can't play anymore. Yep. So it's him and Lawson Lucky and a couple freshmen. So you were thin at tight end, but, yep. uh, you know, I well, think they, they that – uh, They brought in the Eurasian kid, right? They brought – there's a reason they, they brought in the guy. I'll bring him in in the summer. Um, um, it's uh, the, the, Stan, the Stanford tight end. So, I mean, they, Georgia, they're, Georgia they're runs so much 12 personnel. Yep. You, you definitely need him. Yep. Uh, but – when I think about the production loss between Lad McConkey and uh, Brock Bowers, I also, to your point, who's going to be the guy? You need two because that was how the offense was predicated. If your safety slides over to cap Brock Bowers, you're giving Lad more room to work with. Lad tore him apart. If you decide you yep. need to shade over towards Lad and you're going to put a yep. linebacker on Brock, <laughs> Oh, well, that's a first down. We know, we know that's not going to work. You know, oh, you're going to bring a safety on top of him? He's just yep. going to shove that dude out of the way. You know, so he's, he's either too fast or too strong. And if you're shading him, you got Lad working his magic on the other side. But Dylan Bell is going to be a monster. Uh, like you said, Dominic, I love it. Oh, oh I forgot about Dylan Second leading receiver yeah. last year. I knew I was missing. Yeah. Dominic, Ra Ra Thomas, uh, beginning. Arian Smith. So I, I've mentioned something about Arian because the eclipse happened this year, right? Or this week. And everyone's like, uh, oh, the eclipse is great. And it, it is cool. I mean, I love, I'm a nerd. I love that stuff. I said, you know, as, as much as I like to see an eclipse, I would like to see, you know, Arian Smith used to his capability. That would be, that's more exciting to me. And someone's like, well, he drops the ball too much. You know, I'm like, okay, let's look at the facts. He's had 40 passes, 40 targets. He's dropped three. He's only had 40 right. passes in yeah. four years of college football. Three drops, yeah. And, of course, yeah. they're big. You remember those because they're, he's usually wide-ass open 10 yards behind the defense. And when you miss that one, it's, it's a right. much bigger. It looks worse. It, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, second and five, and it hits uh, Dylan Bell. Hell, I mean, remember Lad McConkey had the drops for a while. You know, go back a couple of years and we're just like, lads dropping in. What the hell? And he went for like two, three games and he had the yips and then all of a sudden it was gone. He caught everything. Yep. Uh, guys will have that, but you've got the fastest yep. man in college football who is just, I mean, on a go route, what are you going to do? You better have a 30 yard head start on him. And when he slams on the brakes, he can stop on a dime too. So uh, give him that capability. He's very physical. The first practice we saw, he put his face mask into uh, uh, one of the cornerbacks just right in his chest. Laid into him. I'm like, is that Arian Smith? Is that 11? So, uh, yeah, he won't. That, he I think you get play, the production back with those really good wide receivers. And we're going to see that Saturday. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I think, I yeah, think I I'm, and I'm excited about it. So, yeah, I, I, so I'm excited about it. You're exactly right. And I mean, Arian Smith wants to play. I mean, when you talk about a guy that's now uh, blocking and getting out to people in practice and the Kirby Smart coach teams, that means he wants to play. So, I yeah. like that. I'm excited about that. I want to see. So I that. think that's what we're going to see is just a, a lot of passing. You'll get to see Gunner light it up too. And uh, Colby Young had a couple uh, had some good plays in the red zone. He's a transfer from Miami. Everyone will notice him when he's out. You'll see Tyler Williams and Colby Young, two you know, six foot four, six foot five wide receivers. Get to see them do, uh, do their stuff in the red zone. I don't know that we'll see a lot from London Humphreys. I don't know that we'll see a lot from Michael Jackson uh, Jr. or the third third. So the transfer guys coming in, but uh, I would really like to see Andrew Paul. This is year two off of that ACL. Yep. So yep. You know, the offense should be fun. The defense will be interesting. I do hope we get to see full speed kick returns. I want to see Anthony Evans. You're not going to. <laughs> I, just, I want to. I want to see Anthony Evans. Yeah, I like Anthony Evans. Lightning in a bottle, baby. He had a couple of games last year, man, where he got the ball. Like, ooh, okay. That that dude that dude ooh 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 <laughs> like you do a lot of that you do a lot of ooh ooh like he's different so yeah we'll see you know and I mean we're dude look Lab McConkey's been gone Cole Spear 
we always look at that next little uh, miniature white boy wide receiver and always compare him to Julian Edelman or Tim Dwight. <laughs> you know, is he going to be the next guy in there? I don't know. So, yeah, it's fun well, to watch, man. And, 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 and the, good, the good thing about this offense is Carson Beck is going to be left standing upright a ton because I think the offense yeah. line is going to be really good this year. And Carson Beck is going to have an understanding of the offense. Second year with Bobo as a coordinator. Second year as a starter being the man. Tons of time to prepare. He is going to stand in the pocket and find his guys. So you're going to see a lot of people touch the football in spring and when the season rolls around for Georgia. So, um, you know, it's just going to be a matter of who ends up being the standout guy that makes a play. So, you know, I don't know. I, uh, again, wide receiver, I want to see that position grouping on offense more than anywhere else and see who the guys are this year. But, yeah, Bell and Smith, I, 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 I said that. I said that, and we keep naming players. Dylan Bell, Aaron Smith. London Humphrey, Colby Young, Rara Thomas, Dom Lovett. I mean, you name five or six guys that are NFL type players. Um, you know, you just want to see one step up and be a superstar. So, and we don't know who that's going to be yet. Hey, so keep Kobe your eyes, Kobe White, baby. Yep. I was told he is quick. I didn't say he was fast. They say he was quick. And we at Rivals didn't have him ranked as high as maybe uh, some of the fans wanted. But every time Jed went to a game, Jed will always say, look, I'm not into analysis. I'm into reporting. Okay. Jed, what would you think of Sokovi? Man, that kid. <laughs> he, would just, he would just gush. Yeah. Just, again, as, a, as an objective reporter, Russ, just objectively, when you see a guy that nobody can catch, nobody can touch, and he's just zipping through, through all of them, you're like, okay, I don't need to be a, a fanboy, but damn. <laughs> he's pretty good. That boy good. Well, and, and I think the depth there, the potential depth of wide receiver is important because you're not going to get in a situation where you have a receiver that gets hurt in a big game and end up having to make a bunch of Oh, excuses. that's a nice shirt. Um, Shout I don't, out to the 7-6. So, yeah, 7-6 apparel company. Um, so, you know, the depth is there. It's just a matter of who's going to be the dude. So, we'll see. Um Wait, so Willie Gray, you can speak to this. Kobe White's from your hometown? Okay. He's smaller like Lab, but Rob, yeah, he's not huge. But again, hell, uh, Devontae Smith wasn't big. Wasn't yeah, you man. ain't got to be big. If you know what to do, you're smart, you're tough, and you're willing, by the way. That's one thing about Lad, right? Lad was very smart. He was very quick and out of his breaks, and he was willing to go in and grab a ball even if he was going to get popped. If you're willing and you're tough and you're quick, you can play for Kirby Smart. So. Um, I think you'll see Kobe. Well, hell, that, that's Kirby Smart. Yeah, maybe not the quick part, but as far as <laughs> willing and tough, yeah. Um, <laughs> he wasn't big. No, he wasn't. He was. He probably was quick back in the day when he played. I bet he's going to see Marino's a bunch. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of guys there. I mean, you know, that's assuming that none of these receivers are the ones that hit the transfer portal. And I mean, I, and I don't know, we talked about having some, we, we all hear whispers of who's going to leave. And, and I've heard a few, I haven't heard any receivers in, in the circles I talked to. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised you see a receiver to hit the portal after this, after this spring is over with, just because there's a lot of mouths you're trying to feed right there. So, yeah, uh, we'll talk about that. Let's, let's switch gears because to me, uh, G day, we, we know it'll be a vanilla offense. It'll be a lot of passing because you don't want to hurt anybody to your point or, you know, we won't see, live kickoffs and live punt returns as much as I'd love to. But, again, that's also dangerous, so they won't do it. But And I just want to see Anthony Evans return a couple kicks or so. Uh, Jeff Dyer says, do you see any quarterback names you guys expect to see in the portal next week? I don't know yet. We, we've And we've seen the thing about uh, Bear. Bear Alexander supposedly right. was going to be in it. Uh, some outlet broke the news. Everybody went with it. Then Bear came out today and said, I don't know where the hell this is coming from. The bear is not in the portal. He is not in the portal. So there's a media outlet with egg on their face, but then they they all have egg on their face, including our, our rivals, because we took it as like, well, hey, we're here and he's transferring too. So wherever it came from, I don't know. But the point was, he came out today and said, I don't know where all this is coming from. 48, 24, 48 hours later, apparently did not. He couldn't shoot that rumor down any earlier. Right. Uh, he says he's going to stick it out at USC. And I pointed out that he went to four different high schools, actually named them, uh, four different high schools, uh, Skyline, Denton, you know, they, 
Yeah. And uh, IMG then to Georgia, then to USC was about to go to seventh school in seven years. Very interesting thing there. Uh, but I, I don't want to speculate. My point is the speculation about Bear, a lot of people have eggs on their face because he's staying where he's at. To the mm-hmm. question here, do we see any quarterback names in the portal? I could name a few who I've heard might go in the portal, and then all of a sudden it's like it'll be reported. Roddy said he is going in the portal. The kid shoots it down, and you just look like an idiot. And a lot of kids are going to have a conversation with their coach. Hey, I think I can get X at yep. school Y. What can you do for me? And that might have been a situation where they did with Bear. Hey, I've got an offer to go to Texas or Texas A&M you know, for a million bucks. What can you do for me? And USC steps up. And then he's like, oh, I was never going anywhere. Right. We had that happen with three starters at UGA last year. Two of them put their names in the damn portal and then didn't actually go through it. They, they announced they were going to. Georgia worked it out with them. Yep. You know, and then they said, oh, I just changed my mind. BS. you got no, a better deal. Yeah, There's one it. of them. It's a really big name who was an absolute ass. And the coaches were almost to the point of saying, just go. But they yeah. know they need him. Right. And it was uh, every every couple of days. It was you know, just I don't call it whining, but you know, right. I, I, I can so and so's getting this, next is getting that. And it's like, dude, stay or go, make a decision. So we, because as what Kirby says, he's like, look, I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm gonna coach the guys I got. Right. So to well, that and, end, and very and very for Georgia, we have the depth for Kirby to take that stance and feel good about it. There's not many guys on Georgia's roster. If you lose you're going to feel like your season's in a bad spot. Um, you know, I'm careful to say this one because I don't want Kirby mad at me here. But, I mean, Carson Beck is probably the only person on Georgia's roster that where if he said he was leaving, you'd be like, well, we're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> everybody else on that roster. We are we are out of luck. Everybody else on that roster. Uh, no, don't get me wrong. There's dudes you don't want to lose. A ton of dudes you don't want to lose. But everywhere else, you've got the depth around it where you're just like, all right, we'll be all right. So every school out there is not in that situation. And the NIL stuff, we, we talk about this a lot on, on this show. Um, it, it's it's going to get fixed. And, and, and I say fixed loosely because I don't know what fixed means, but it's going to get regulated within the next couple of years. I firmly believe that. It, and, and it's got to, by the way. It cannot continue on like this because if, if you're a player, and, 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 and I, I wasn't raised like this. I don't think I would have done this. Um, just because I, I don't know, loyalty loyalty is very important for me, probably to a fault. But a lot of these kids, man, it's just it's it's free agency trying to get paid and take care of their families without knowing their situations. I would say be slow to judge a lot of these kids who go in the portal trying to get a paycheck because it's not like you have contracts that are negotiating and you're going to get it. A lot of times, if you don't speak up as a player and you just stay in your corner and keep doing your thing, the coaches are not going to worry about you because they're going to grease that squeaky wheel, so to speak. Yep. So you've got some kids that want to put their name in the portal because they're like, hey, man, look, I'm starting now. That other cat over there is getting 10 grand a month. I'm getting four grand a month. There's That's, that's dumb. I'm going in the portal. I need more than, than that because I've got bills to pay. I'm trying to take care of my family. I've got a, a mama who's going through this. I've got a sister who's going through that. You know, I've got X amount I'm going on here. I'm worth more than that. So they go in the portal just to force the schools to come up and pony up the money and get there. And every school, by the way, is grumbling about how little NIL money they have right now. Every school is doing it. There's a few out there you look at and say, all right, they got it figured out. But for the most part, every school's grumbling about it. But it's, the, it's amazing how much money ends up showing up when it has to be had for these players that these schools really want to keep. So the, the, the crazy thing about that is those, it, can't keep, it can't continue for college football to be sustainable. It's going – because the haves and the have-nots are going to keep widening out. Very fortunately, we cheer for a school that's one of the haves. Like, Georgia is one of the haves. Now, I know Georgia has some NIL issues they're having to work through. Kirby's talked about that some. If you follow anybody who's associated with the Athletic Association right now and talk to them or hear them talk, like, we've got work to do to keep up with these schools that are trying to buy championships and trying to buy their way in front of us. But we have the resources in the back to get there. But they're going to have to figure it out. And, and I've said this before. I think the transfer portal is a bigger issue than the NIL stuff is. I think the transfer portal is a bigger issue for college football than the transfer portal. For these kids to be able to go in the portal every single year with no repercussions and with no ability for the school to say anything to them about it, 
it's, it's just not good. It's not good for those kids. It's not good for the schools. It's not good for college football. So that's got to be figured out and fixed in the next few years. And then they're going to regulate NIL. I don't see any reason, any, any way they don't do that because you can't expect NC State to be able to compete with Georgia. You can't expect, you know, I don't even, I don't even know a school to say here. Uh, Mississippi, well, State, Mississippi State, State you know, to, to, to compete with Ole Miss. Yeah, it, it's, it's not going to happen. So, it's going to become a revenue sharing system, something along those lines. And they got to fix the portal, though, because me, me and you were talking, you and I were talking um, pre show just about what we're going through tonight, make sure we're on the same page. And you made a comment, you're like, hey, G Day's fun, G Day's cool, but the fireworks start again next week for college football. And that's exactly One right. Day. The headlines come when the portal opens back up and some of the names that go in there. Now, it's hard to know because a lot of people online are clickbait people that just say, if y'all could, only, if y'all only knew the names I've been hearing that may go in the portal, oh boy, they're just trying to get you to follow them on Twitter, X, whatever. Um, but there are huge names in the college football world that will go in the portal next week. Does that mean they're all leaving their school? No, it may mean they're trying to negotiate for more money, whatever it is. But um, Dude, if if I'm a decent kid, if I'm in the two deep, I tell the coach I'm putting my name in. Yeah. There's no downside. They don't kick you off. You're, no. you're on the two deep. No. If you're third or fourth string, don't don't make that challenge. Right. Coaches will call you on it. Right. Uh, but if you're, you, hey, I'm the backup inside linebacker. You know, I'm the I'm the backup mic. I'm the number two mic. I'm like, yeah. hey, you know, I could be the number one mic at Virginia Tech, and they're offering yep. me three hundred thousand dollars, and I'm making you know ten grand a month here. That's was one hundred twenty. Uh, they're offering me more than almost three times, coach. You know, even if they're not. I'd say they were. <laughs> and, and, by, and, by, and by the way, you, you think about you think about in Georgia, we get mad at kids. And by the way, it's time for fans to quit being mad at kids about entering the portal. Now, if Barry Alexander had have gone in again and he goes in that many times, okay, you could say something about that situation. All right, we don't agree. He's not making good decisions. But you know, we get mad at kids going to the portal, but then we get Travis Etienne, Colby Young, being your second, and we're like, yes, we're getting some dudes that we need over here. Let's go. Good kids right there, man, leaving bad programs. Hey, if there's a defensive lineman, a talented defensive lineman in the portal, everybody's going to be like, do whatever it takes yeah. to get him. Yeah. And I mean, and a lot of these guys are making pure business decisions from the standpoint. And it's not, it's not always about, this is an important point that I'm about to make. So get your notepad out, people. I'm about to tell you all something that's important here. You're going to be like, ooh, Russ, that's a good point. All right. It's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Um, but a, a lot of times we are trying to go get just more NIL money, right? They may be trying to get 20 grand a month instead of 10 grand a month. Sure, that happens a ton, by the way. And, and, and kids get it sometimes. But there are situations where a kid, let, let's say ETN would be a guy, for example, which ETN would have been the dude at Florida number one guy, so the analogy fails a little bit. But let's say there's a running back, a guy that's going to be a potential big NFL prospect, but you're behind another big NFL prospect. You're behind a guy that you're not going to beat you know, you're playing behind Jalen Carter. You know, you're playing behind Jordan Davis. Carson you're playing Beck. behind Brock Bowers, whoever it may be. You're playing behind Malachi Starks. And all of a sudden, you're like, all right, I can make it to the NFL and make life-changing money for me and my family. But my shelf life runs up every year I play football I'm on the bench. So if you're a rising sophomore, rising junior, you're like, man, I'm second string at Georgia. I can start at... 128 of the 130 schools across the country right now and get film and get on the field and have a chance to be drafted a year earlier and make that money that I need for my career, for my family, all that, then the portal man. Desmond Marshall, Major Burns, yeah. Alabama, yeah. LSU. Yeah. And, and you know, and we're fine with those guys, right? Like, they handled it the right way. So, um, I think the thing we all get mad about is we feel like somebody's just making a pure money grab when they're trying to kind of stick it to the coaches and force them to do something. Like, we don't like that because it feels sleazy. Hold, I've heard holding the team hostage. Yeah, holding the team hostage. That's exactly right. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, it's going to be real crazy the other day to, to see how it gets fixed in the days, weeks, months, years to come. So, Well, it's going to have to go in-house. You're not going to be able to do it. You're, you'll have to get rid of the collectives. They'll either have to make them uh, employees – give them contracts and it, to, to your point about the, the transfer portal being the bigger issue. That's why they don't sign yearly deals. They basically say, we'll pay you this much per month. Cause you don't know if that kid's going to be here from month to month, to right. month, you know, so you don't sign anything for a year because the kid can show up signing, uh, you know, in December, being early enrollee 
And in March, he's like, screw this. Or April, after G Day, he's been here four months. He's like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going somewhere else. I'm, this this yeah. wasn't what I thought it was going to be. A hundred percent. You know, so you're like, okay, we'll pay you per month when you get here. And here's your obligations that you have to do to earn via your name, image, and likeness. And that's not being done a, a whole lot. So I can, to your point, if you talk to the money people at UGA, at Clemson, at South Carolina, at Florida, at Tennessee, Texas, wherever, there's like, you're right. This isn't sustainable because the market's only going up. There's no reason for the market to go down. Even though the schools that have promised a crap ton of money, Florida promised that quarterback commit a ton of money. That fell apart, egg on their face. Texas a and promises $30 million to their guys. It falls through. The guys say we weren't getting paid that. Ole Miss bought a defense. Apparently, they're having trouble paying all their guys. All these schools are making the promises. But to your point, the people who said, yes, I'll pay them, they don't always write the checks. No. I know a guy right now who is the number two donor at the <laughs> University of Georgia in actual money given. Money promised? He's like seventh and eighth. So he is a, he's the deliverables guy. He delivered what he was going to do. My point is, uh, or maybe he's third or fourth. I'm not sure, but he's yeah. in the top five. Yeah, okay. He, he, he doing all right. He's doing okay. And again, this is um, uh, it is not sustainable. Kirby has gone out telling people, "Look, we got to do something because we're not probably we're not going to lose any starters, but we're going to lose depth pieces. And Georgia's depth is what allows them to beat everybody's brains in." Exactly. You know, so, uh, give me a second string, third string kid from Georgia over anybody at Virginia Tech, anybody over at Louisville. And again, I'm not, I'm being facetious, but the right. point is, you know that you they they landed a high three star, a four star, or a five star who, who's behind another three star, four star, five star, and I don't have those guys. And I'm at Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. I haven't won a title in a while. I really need it. I'm at Ohio State, and I've just lost to Michigan three times in a row. Yeah. How desperate are those people? So when you go to those donors and say, "Look, we need a hundred grand a month to sign this safety," somebody's going to say, "Fine, do it." He's he's, it he's he is going to advertise my law firm, my realtorship, my uh, car business, whatever. I, I'm I'm paying it because I can't lose to Michigan one more time. Right. Georgia fans are like, look, we're sitting on two titles and give you a hundred grand for a kid. Are you nuts? Yeah. Yeah. No, for per month? Per month. Exactly. Are right. you smoking crack? Are you yep. chewing it? What are you, the hell are you doing? And, but there are the schools that will do that. And yep. to your point, it is not sustainable. It has to go in house. And that's what Kirby's telling them. Look, this is the way it is right now. It will not be that way forever, but we don't want to lose all our players between now and whenever it gets fixed. Yep. Not all of them, but we don't lose our depth. So yep. I won't get into it. But to your point, G-Day will be very interesting. Monday after G-Day will be even more interesting to see what happens. Hopefully, George is able to keep all its players, maybe add a defensive lineman. But I don't know what's going to happen. But it's, uh, it, we're going to see we're, we're going to see people testing the waters. Yep. We're excited. Hey, we're excited to do a fire show because we will have stuff to talk about next Wednesday night <laughs> <laughs> out the wazoo. I promise you that. So, yeah. And and to your point, Georgia is a have. If Georgia has money the same way that unless unless they're being outspent rel- relentlessly or just over the top, kids want to come to Georgia. Yep. I mean, you got you took the best player from Mississippi State and the best player from Missouri in one class. Yep. You went and took a great wide receiver from Miami, the best player, the best wide receiver at Vandy. You know, uh, you Not took Florida's best running back this year. Come on, man. Yep. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got a few questions here. I would like to right. uh, run by you real quick. So let me back up. up. Uh, shout out to Foster Moss and Willie Gray and Jeff Dyer for all being on here. I appreciate that. They, they, oh, the weather. 75, 75 and sunny. Is funny. I just don't get any better than that. Uh, Willie says, I just want to see our linebackers get back to the monsters Kirby creates. Is Chaz still with the ones? Uh, Chaz Chambliss is still running number one outside linebacker. Yep. So, you know, Ch- Chaz Chambliss, here's the deal with, with a guy like Chaz Chambliss, right? I mean, he probably doesn't have the the ceiling that Damon Wilson, Gabe, uh, oh, shoot, Gabe Harris, some of those guys have just because they, they are physical freaks. And, and this is not a knock on Chaz Chambliss, by the way. But 
Chaz Chandler's this floor is a lot higher than the young pups. Like, you know what you're getting with him, and you know he's not going to screw it up for you. He's going to do his job well. So, you, Chaz Chandler's would play a ton of football for Georgia because they can trust him. And he's a very good football player. Um, so, he may not have the flash and all the the measurables that some of these young guys do and, and all that. But, yeah, Chaz Chandler's is going to play a ton because you need guys out there that are kind of those – cornerstone, capstone type guys for a team that you can always count on and depend on, and you can worry about somewhere else as a coach, and that's what Chaz Chambliss is. Yeah, to your point, you're like, okay, if they run inside zone and I need him to come up field or cover this area, he's going to identify it quickly and do his job. Yep. I can put in a freshman or a sophomore who oh. might be a little more effective, but he might not identify the play quickly enough. Yep. He gets sucked inside. Now we got a huge gap. Yep. The cutback uh, line happens. So, yeah. yep, good question. So, that, that's uh, to your point, uh, I've had coaches say, look, I will take a consistent player over a gifted one who's prone to mistakes. Yeah. So, or uh, what, what was I think it was uh, Mark Rick said, look, yeah, you guys get all excited about these players and how, how fast they go. But sometimes, if you're the fastest player in the field, you're going 100 miles an hour quicker than anybody else in the wrong direction. In the wrong direction. This is that you overrun plays. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, that's a good point, coach. <laughs> All right. Uh, we asked Jeff asked us about quarterbacks in the portal. We don't know that. Um, here's a good one for you. You were talking about the wide receivers and uh, who will be the guy. Do you think Georgia will have a thousand yard receiver under Kirby Smart? Can Georgia get one guy to a thousand yards? Not, not, not on this roster we have currently. Not the way this team is constructed. I, I don't, I don't think so. Just because I think you got so many mouths to feed who are super talented. By the way, it, it's always funny to me. By the way, when when fans ask a question and say, or they'll say something like, um, I don't know. Mark, let's let's go back last year. Marcus Roseme, Jack Saint. You see him make some really good plays for you, and you'll hear fans say, "Golly, we got to get more. We got to get him the ball more, man." Like you'll see. Uh, I do that. Evans. I do that all the time. Right. Okay. So, so here's the question. Let's say you see that guy make a play. Who do you want to get less touches then? Yeah. <laughs> like who, who is getting the ball a good bit right now who you're like, all right, we should take touches away from him and give it to that guy that I see do something special right there. Um, Cause you start looking at some of that and you're like, Oh, well, okay. Well, well, you got rah, rah. Well, rah, rah is pretty good. Dom love it. Well, Dom love is like super dependable. Uh, Oscar Dale. Well, I mean, Oscar Dell is 6'7", and our best tight end, I don't know. So, I mean, to answer the question, I don't think you'll see a 1,000-yard receiver um, on this roster just because you got so much talent all over the field, and Georgia's going to spread the ball around to make it harder for a defense to stop. I think that's what Munkin did. I think that's what Bobo does, and I think that's the way that Carson Beck is wired. So, um, and, and remember, that's all comes from Kirby. Yeah. Yeah. And his thing is, look, I know as a defensive coordinator, if uh, you're trying, I don't say forcing the ball, but you, you've got one great receiver, you got a Marcus Harrison. Yeah. Well, I know where the ball's going. It makes my job easier. But if you're dumping it to Cash Jones in the flat, and I've covered, you know, I've covered your uh, sluggo routes, you know, I've covered your uh, nine, I've covered everything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, the one thing I didn't have prepared was, you know, Cash in the flat, yep. you know, and all he's got to do is make one miss. And now it's a 17 yard game, man. Come yep. On. So if folks would remember that Kirby plays percentages over the flash or over stats, then you find your answer to that question. So. But it's a great question, Willie, because uh, I don't know that under Kirby, I don't know that that will ever happen. They might, but, uh, KC always has a lot of good uh, questions and comments. We appreciate uh, KC being on the show all the time. Uh, is Georgia going to pursue Bear Alexander? There, now, there ain't a. Let's just ball. say he were still in the portal, even yeah. though he came out today and said he was not going to be in the portal. There ain't a snowball's chance in Valdosta, Georgia, in July that Georgia goes back after Bear Alexander. I would say, I would say, whatever you think the percentages are. Multiply by zero. Cut them, cut them in half and then multiply by zero. Um, <laughs> no. I, you know, I, again, me and Kirby don't talk, right? Kirby doesn't text me and tell me what he's thinking about any of this stuff. I mean, if he's watching and he won't start texting me and telling me that, great. Our ratings will go way up because I better give inside Kirby information. 
But based on a few conversations I did have around the Bear accident situation when he left, I would be beyond shocked if Georgia had pursued him and bring him back. I just don't think, you know, the squeeze ain't worth the juice. Yeah, and again, it's like they would have brought back Brenton Cox. Uh, Jermaine Burton, maybe? But like A.D. Mitchell is like, hey, I want to come back? Hell yeah. Come on, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll send the plane. Does yep. Don Lieber still have that plane? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you Trez, Marshall, if Trez Marshall from Alabama balled out and wanted to come back, great. Come on back. But there's some guys that leave the portal that Georgia's not going to pursue and want back. And I think Bear's probably going to be one of those. And hopefully, and look, I hope Bear Alexander has a great year at USC, makes it in the NFL, and is super successful in life. Do I think he's going to do that wearing the Power G again? Absolutely not. No. And to your point, um, Georgia needs him, but I don't think they need – Georgia needs a great defensive tackle. Yep. Don't know that they need that defensive tackle because yep. a lot of the reason that Kirby uh, doesn't pay the most for freshman kids or even guys in the portal because he's like, look, I'm not going to screw up my locker room chemistry. And right. somebody asked in here, how do these players know what the other players get? Those damn players talk. Yeah, you know. In my business, okay, I run a Georgia media site. Or the rivals network. I guarantee you when they were negotiating a deal with our Alabama side or our Tennessee side or our Florida site, I'm calling them up saying, what did they offer you? Right. Dude, what, hey, what are you getting on ad rev? You know, ad revenue, what, you, what percentage? 48%. I mean, dude, I already get like 65, you know, they're, they're low ball on you. Oh, and they want to give you that percentage. You know, we, everybody knows what everybody's making in my industry. You think guys in the locker room are going to do the same damn thing. Right. So if a bear comes back and he's like, I'm getting paid more than all you SOBs. Yeah. Your, your locker room, it introduces a brand new cancer there. So that's not going to happen. Yep. Uh, Matthew says uh, that our wide receiver that went to Bama hit differently. We just beat Bama. He got a good bit of playing time. He just followed the money. Yeah. That, that did hit. Cause you were talking about guys that transfer and how it feels different, you know, and how you root for some and not for others. Yeah, that was that was a bit different. Yeah, it hurt watching Burton play over there at Bama. I think Bama has been obviously the arch rival there. So, you know, A.D. Mitchell, by the way, I saw in a mock draft, A.D. Mitchell's being projected a first-round pick now in a lot of places. So, um, you know, it hurt to lose him. And Jermaine Burton's a really good receiver, really good football yes. player. You know, we didn't feel the same about him. I say we. <laughs> like us Georgia fans are together. We didn't feel the same about Burton as we A.D. Mitchell for whatever reason. So, no, we did um, not. You're right. Mm-hmm. Um, Willie Gray's kissing up to you, saying he my agrees guy, with you, Willie, guys. My guy. I don't know where you're from, Willie Gray, but I like you. I like that dog, man. That's a cute dog. To say it louder for people to back Russ. Hey, stop. You're going to give Russ a bigger head than he's already got. Y'all say nice things to him. Let's hey, stop I, that. I do have an enormous head. When I was in middle school, by the way, our entire team wore blue helmets in middle school, but they didn't have a blue middle school helmet that fit me. So I had to wear a varsity helmet, and it was silver. And I wore number one and played quarterback and middle linebacker. So I was the biggest kid on the field with a different color helmet on, wearing number one, played quarterback and middle linebacker. You can tell me Ed Tanner did take some spray paint to that thing? I wouldn't let him. I wouldn't let him. I was worried about what was going to happen. You wanted to be special. I would end up with a blue cam uh, camo blue. <laughs> <laughs> hey, then they wouldn't have seen you at quarterback. Yeah, they just saw me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a good question. Uh, Willie Gray, I tease him about kissing up to you because yeah, we, we love our commenters and we appreciate it. Yeah. He says, I don't know if y'all can tell me, but who is Georgia's big donors like the Auburn Yellowwood guy? So, so I, I, I won't say names. I don't, know, I don't know if we can even say names. I actually don't know a lot of them. But here's what I'll tell you. Look up liquor distributorships <laughs> and see who owns liquor distributorships that have UGA ties. I already asked you if Don Lieber had his jet was still available. So. Yeah. So look look at the names that get put up on locker rooms. Anything, anytime something new gets built and you see a name like, who is Jimmy Smith? Okay. There, yeah. There, there's some when, guys. When out you there. see the name on the locker room or the head coach position or the uh, president position or whatever it is, if there is a name on the title, yep. you know, the so and so offensive coordinator at the University of Georgia. Exactly that part, right. the preseason offensive coordinator, that named position, that is usually one of the big donors. But to the point, Willie, there is not – like that guy that left uh, 
millions of dollars to Missouri, like T Boone Pickens in uh, Oklahoma, well, Oklahoma State, yeah. where he gives his money. Uh, there's not that just ridiculous Man, donor, a Phil Knight in Oregon. Right. Uh, that Georgia has Georgia has some really rich people, but there's there's not anybody. It would solve a lot of issues if Georgia had a, a just a multi gajillionaire who's like, okay, you guys need nil. It's fifteen million dollars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Georgia doesn't have that we know of an out and out billionaire with a B on there that just wants okay. the program to kill it all the time. So I don't know. Maybe one day, man, if I make it to be a billionaire, I'd love to be that guy. By the way, but I mean. I, I do know one guy who's given a million dollars and he wants to s- crack his business up. This is a different guy that I was talking about earlier. Uh, he's like, look, if I, if my business grows the way I want it to, I'll be a, a $10 million guy, you know? So, I mean, that's how much he wants to win. Mm. And again, he's still hungry from, even though he won two, you're like, this is fun. Let's do it. Let's do it more. Yep. So if uh, his business grows, he will do it. And I, I take the man at his word. So, uh, Willie also asks, is Delta affiliated with uh, Georgia any? You know, what about Coke? What about Home Depot? And I've been told, because I've always said, look, if you really want this to change, get corporate money involved. But corporations also know that if you, like your Tito's vodka, you give $20 million to the University of Texas. All of a sudden, nobody in Oklahoma is drinking Tito's vodka anymore. Exactly right. <laughs> screw, screw that. You know, people in Georgia now, uh, they're getting hunker. Handle it. <laughs> Only about that much left in that bottle. <laughs> There's a mostly empty bo- uh, handle of uh, hunker vodka behind me, but they're coming out and saying, "Look, you know, ASW, a bunch of Georgia grads created a great vodka." And they said, "Look, don't drink Tito's because you'll you're helping Texas." I could see Delta saying, "Look, if we come out and we support Georgia, we're going to lose tech clients, Tennessee clients, Florida. People, all of a sudden, they're all flying uh, United." So, so, so here, here's a here's a point with that though. The those big corporations like that, by the way when they hire NIL people and they do, they're doing it for what NIL was created for in the first place. They're going out and hiring Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese to uh, the, the college basketball girls that just went out. They're going out and hiring, you know, Caleb Williams and Brock Bowers, the biggest names in college football, Marvin Harrison Jr. These people with national appeal who have proven their worth on the field. And now they're trying to hire them as paid spokesmen for their product. That's what NIL was created for. It was not created to be a recruiting tool, and that's all it is now. Uh, that's what it's turned into. So, you know, the Deltas, Home Depots, and all those, they just operate on a national scale. Yes, they're Georgia-based companies, but they're not dogs. <laughs> you know, you could look yeah. in their, their boardroom. They're not all a bunch of UGA guys that went over here, love it, or tailgating on South Lumpkin, or South Mills, where, you know, that's not what's going on. They're trying to figure out how to grow that investor bottom line on the publicly traded stuff. So you're just not going to get money from places like that. Yeah. I'd always hoped, but, but here's the thing. If you are a well-to-do business, you know, and you bring it in millions a year and you are a Georgia grad, then there's, there's lots you can do. Sure. But the, the best thing, if Georgia is not able to get the multi-billionaire uh, donor, they can't get the corporate money. is you get a bunch of, you, let's say you got 43,000, half the people go to the, the stadium uh, let's say uh, 46,500 go to the stadium. If you can get two thirds of them to give 21 bucks a month, then all of a sudden okay. you're like, Hey, we're, we're golden. So yeah. It goes a long, long way. It does. And, and, they, uh, and is the classic city collective doing a great job? They, I'll put it this, they could do a better job, but it has changed so fast. Right that it is tough to change your structure on a dime. I know Matt Hibbs. He is one of the most qualified guys I've ever met for the job. Is Kirby Smart's handpicked guy, um, but they don't have the staff and they don't have the resource to do a lot of stuff. People want to do. So um, they're, they're, they're trying their best. And if they had the budget, then they would do more. Again, I don't get anything out of it. I'm going to cover Georgia regardless. They could right. I'm here. People are like, well, why are you sounding the alarm? I'm like, I'm just trying to warn you of what's coming and yeah. how things are because Kirby's doing it. And if Kirby's saying something behind the scenes and I'm, re- I'm privy to it, I'm going to tell all you people yep. what Kirby's saying behind the scenes because that yep. to me is the epitome of my job. Yep. That's right. But 
anyway, that's all the time we have for this week. Unless you had something else you want to touch on, Russ. I'm good, brother. It's uh, it's 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 fun to talk about this time of year. I mean, we got a lot going on right now, and uh, be a lot more going on after this weekend. So yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about G Day as long as I can stay at home and watch it. <laughs> So you folks pay attention, uh, or, you know, to G Day, and then come loaded for bear next Wednesday, eight o'clock. We'll talk about our G Day reactions and what what you thought. We want to hear from you. We'll pepper Russ with a bunch of questions. We'll get his expert analysis, and uh, we'll get your questions answered next week. We'll talk to you then. Everybody, take Good care. Dogs.